I want to pay tribute to the organizer of this plenary session because there are such a lot of connected and very diverse topics under the umbrella of sustainable development. I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, Professor Dr. Salim Rehan, um, whom I will be meeting virtually after a long time of having met him physically um, in Pakistan. Uh, Professor Dr. Salim Rehan is the executive director of the South Asian Network on Economic Modeling, which has a, a very poetic name called Sanam. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, and uh, he's joining us from Dhaka. Uh, is that right, Salim? Uh, yes, it is, uh, Professor Ali. A very nice meeting you after a long time. Welcome to Islamabad virtually, <laughs> and I yes, hope sir. that you know um, you, uh, we can meet physically uh, also. And uh, I'm sure you must be feeling very good because uh, from this podium, I think we have recognized the efforts that Bangladesh has managed to undertake through policy and uh, programmatic interventions in claiming its position in uh, South Asia. And uh, I think um, uh, we are very proud of uh, that as well. Um, Dr. Salim Rehan is going to talk about structural transformation in South Asia. So let us see how he deals with this very broad but very important topic. So over to you, uh, Professor Dr. Salim. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, is my screen, uh, you can't see my screen, I think. Yes, uh, if you can put it on slideshow, uh, then we'll be yeah. able to, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, no, thank you so much. I think uh, I also requested uh, Professor Bushra that, uh, uh, you know, because there is a kind of accidental power cut in my office area and which is actually affected uh, the kind of connect connection and uh, I'm actually running my battery on my laptop and also the internet connection. So uh, in any case, uh, thank you so much organizers for inviting me to this uh, excellent uh, conference. And I, when I look at this agenda, I see it is very rich content and very renowned speakers uh, this morning uh, or this afternoon, I should say, we heard Professor Land Pritchett. And uh, in line with that, actually what I'm going to present here today uh, uh, is the challenge of structural transformation in South Asia. The story is that uh, I'll talk uh, briefly about what, what do you mean by structural transformation? And then what is the kind of status of South Asia in terms of structural transformation and the kind of challenges uh, the South Asian countries are facing? So I will not really make an aggregate of South Asian countries. I, will, I have picked five South Asian countries, five leading South Asian countries, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. And I have also tried to make a comparison of these five countries with some uh, two countries in, two or three countries in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, uh, to some extent. So let's see uh, how we actually uh, uh, see the structural transformation and the kind of challenges. So we, I think all of us know that what uh, by structural transformation we mean a shift of economic activity from a less to a more productive sector which spurs economic development in the classical school of economic theory, uh, for example, from Louis or Calder, uh, as well as pioneers of se sectoral-based analysis in development economics, such as Chenery, Harshman, and Midral, we have seen this kind of mentioning of structural transformation and its importance. Uh, and why is it important? Because the major factor, uh, I'm just trying to say in one single sentence, but there could be many, many explanations to that, but I try to emphasize on that particular point that the major factor differentiating successful countries from unsuccessful ones is the pace at which this structural transformation unfolds. So I think uh, uh, to some extent, the way Professor Land Pritchett actually he was talking, he was comparing countries with respect to uh, the growth in per capita income and the kind of associated differently structural transformation, which also brings with the growth of per capita income. Uh, I think that, that really makes how there are some successful countries and there are some unsuccessful countries. So let's have a look at the economic growth performance in South Asia. And when you talk about this economic growth performance, I, I, we, meant, we mean annual GDP growth rate. So here I have plotted the five South Asian countries and uh, since uh, 1972, so almost last 50 years, so that was the whole idea. So last 50 years, what is the kind of growth 
or experience in terms of GDP growth experience, annual GDP growth experience of the five South Asian countries. You can see that uh, while Bangladesh has a kind of gradual rise, uh, but when uh, in, the, in the GDP growth rate, India's performance is also remarkable in certain period. India has episodic, very high economic growth, but uh, quite kind of, uh, uh, if you can see, uh, in terms of stability of the growth rate is not that great as Bangladesh actually achieved. Nepal actually explained a kind of secular decline. Sri Lanka is also kind of, you can see that uh, kind of uh, decline. And in Pakistan's case, as I have, we have been hearing from other speakers, is the growth story has not been that great. So in terms of economic growth in South Asia, we are seeing a very mixed picture. Uh, India performed well. India made a lot of progress and also had very high degree of economic growth in certain episodes, but high degree of volatility as well. In contrast, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan, they had some periods of high growth, but over the years, if you see, take a very longer time horizon, there is a kind of secular decline. But in contrast, Bangladesh is kind of appears as a different story where it has a kind of secular rise. Probably you can forget the very recent episode of COVID, but in general, these countries actually had this kind of growth episodes. Now, this table is interesting. What I really wanted to do, I want to make comparison of these five countries of South Asia with China and Vietnam. Now, this is a very interesting story, which actually is, which is unfold here. You see, in 1985, all these uh, seven countries, they had almost similar per capita GDP, uh, around 250 to 350 US dollars. You can see what I have done here, that I have made Bangladesh per capita GDP as the as one in 1985, and then I have just made other ones in, in proportion to Bangladesh's per capita GDP. You can see that India had a higher per capita GDP than Bangladesh. Nepal, of course, had lower per capita GDP. Pakistan has almost 1.4 times of per capita GDP than Bangladesh in 1985. Sri Lanka had 1.5 times. China's per capita GDP was, uh, was actually lower than India's per capita GDP in, in 1985. And Vietnam's per capita GDP was much lower than uh, Bangladesh's, uh, was much lower than per capita GDP of Bangladesh, and of course, much lower than of that of Pakistan. Now, now what happened uh, in 2020? You can see in 2020, things got radically changed. Uh, Bangladesh's per capita GDP suppressed uh, in uh, of India's and of course, Pakistan's and Nepal's as well. Uh, so in South Asia, Bangladesh appeared as a kind of very, good performer uh, compared to the other South Asian countries. But when you make a comparison of even Bangladesh with other uh, two countries of, uh, of you know, uh, outside of South Asia, definitely China and Vietnam, they had remarkable experience. China from 294 US dollar, they crossed more than $10,000 over the same period. And they actually increased the per capita GDP by more than 35 times and Vietnam by 15 times. So Vietnam's per capita GDP is 1.56 times of Bangladesh's per capita GDP in 2020. So in South Asia, what we found that Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, they had around nine to 10% of <clears throat> growth in per capita GDP uh, to, uh, when you compare 2020 over 1985. But the performance of uh, Pakistan uh, was not that great and India and uh, India had a bit of moderate performance and Nepal as well uh, had some moderate performance. So with this kind of uh, uh, comparison that when you make a comparison amongst ourselves, probably that, is, that tells you one part of the story and that also definitely is a good part of the story, but we need to compare ourselves, uh, ourselves means the South Asian countries with some of the very good performers outside of South Asia, and here China and Vietnam, they are at some very good performers. Now, I also try to look at the structural change in GDP because we are talking about structural transformation. Now, let's have a look at the structural change in GDP uh, in these countries, in, this, uh, in these five countries. So Bangladesh uh, actually faced an episode of, uh, you can see the growing importance of industry. Uh, uh, and falling agriculture, of course, the blue part is agriculture and the uh, gray part is services and the yellow part is the industry. Uh, India 
kind of they in the recent years they actually can see the this yellow part is uh, kind of that that part is shaped uh, in recent years nepal in any case they had a very small uh, share of industry pakistan uh, also kind of main you can see the kind of a static position of that industry share and by industry i have to mention here that it includes construction so when you, i will show you the, what is happening to the manufacturing sector then the story actually becomes a bit different and sri lanka as well you can see that the industry share remain kind of stagnant so in terms of employment in all these five countries uh, agriculture still dominates uh, in terms of share in employment and uh, nepal has definitely a very large share of uh, agriculture uh, in, in, in terms of tot in total employment and you can see in the case of pakistan the share did not change much the the blue part in bangladesh the share declined in india as well but not very significantly still in bangladesh more than for around 40% of employment is in agriculture uh, to some extent sri lanka actually uh, had a bit of a reduced rate of a, a share of agriculture in, in, in total employment around 20% so this is the this is the figure probably we'd like to be more interested in that uh, what is the manufacturing share in gdp because when it comes to structural transformation as i said moving from low productive to a high productive uh, sector and we see that probably except bangladesh this red line is actually bangladesh which is actually growing other south asian countries they are experiencing a fall in share of manufacturing share uh, falling manufacturing share in gdp in, in recent years so this is something I would say that uh, probably uh, it's a question mark whether we are experiencing a premature kind of deindustrialization de in South Asian countries. And this is something comes from one of my very recent work where it actually showed that India is actually facing a premature deindustrialization. How? Here I have plotted, uh, you can see that log of per capita GDP here in the XXX and the manufacturing value added share in GDP in the y-axis. Malaysia is also experiencing a falling share of part, uh, in manufacturing, uh, uh, manufacturing GDP, but at a very high level of per capita GDP. That means what is happening in Malaysia is not premature deindustrialization. It is at, at a more matured level of deindustrialization that happened in many European countries as well. While Bangladesh still going up in terms of manufacturing value added, in the Indian case, what we are seeing, uh, seeing a falling share of manufacturing value added at a very low level of per capita GDP compared to uh, what we have observed in Malaysia. So that raised the big concerns whether in India, India is the, the biggest economy in, this, in South Asia, around 70% or more than 70% of GDP, South Asian GDP. And it shows that there is a big concern where the premature deindustrialization probably is taking place in India. I have some, uh, uh, there's another slide too, and this comes from uh, one of the recent books, uh, The Developer's Dilemma, Structural Transformation, Inequality, Dynamics, and Inclusive Growth. And this is a book edited by four authors, and uh, I have worked closely with them, and especially with Professor Kunalsen. So where we try to actually understand that what are the dynamics of industrialization in different countries? So if we have manufacturing value-added share in the x axis here, and, uh, uh, and where we, if, we, it is, if it is increasing and this manufacturing employment share is in the y axis, then if they are stuck somewhere in the middle, then we call them stalled industrialization. And if we are seeing some advanced level of industrialization where the manufacturing value is increasing, probably the employment is not, uh, in terms of share in GDP, is not really increasing that much. That is kind of advanced industrialization. But we are also seeing the upgrading industrialization in some many of the developing countries, where especially Southeast Asian countries and East Asian countries, where both the shares of employment and GDP of manufacturing actually increased. So with this kind of framework, and also we are seeing the secular deindustrialization, where both the shares declining, and the primary de uh, industrialization where probably we are, we are experiencing some employment share, rise in employment share, but not that much of value added, uh, rise in value added share of manufacturing. So with this kind of framework, what we did in my chapter in this particular book, uh, I applied that. Uh, and then we found that the Bangladesh case actually still is experiencing uh, the upgrading industrialization. 
uh, especially with respect to the share of manufacturing value added and share of manufacturing employment. In, uh, so it probably that is one a very interesting case in South Asia where uh, uh, the Bangladesh case appears to show, demonstrate that the country is still experiencing upgrading industrialization. In contrast, in India, I've showed you earlier in one of my works, but this is the paper in the same volume uh, done by Shaun Rai and Shabashachi Kaur. They have shown that actually at certain point in this Indian case, actually move from advanced industrialization to primary industrialization. They declined after this, uh, they actually stepped back. And then there is a fall to secular deindustrialization too. So as I have showed you earlier, that uh, comparison of India with Malaysia, uh, this story of Sean Roy and Shaboshachi Kaur in their chapter also actually resembles the kind of findings what I have found in my own work. Unfortunately, we didn't have any chapter on Pakistan in that particular volume, but I, I'm quite sure that the kind of findings or the analysis uh, on Bangladesh and India would be helpful for uh, uh, understanding the, the challenges in Pakistan as well. So when you talk about structural transformation, it's not only the transformation with respect to increasing share of uh, manufacturing value and employment, but at the same time, whether that is contributing to rising inequality. So I'll not spend time here, but I just want to mention that in the same volume, we found that the kind of structural transformation which has taken place in South Asia, it has actually what you call, uh, what we call on the, on the top uh, uh, corner of the box is the Kuznetsian tension, the strong tension. Whereas you have this structural transformation, but at the same time, uh, there is the inequality, rising inequality as well in South Asia. Actually, we analyze this through different episodes as well. And uh, that means the kind of structural transformation which is taking place in South Asia is not inequality reducing. It is actually, and probably we can bring in the other issues of inclusive growth as well. It's not really inclusive in, the, in, the, in that sense. Now, I will also bring in there are two other aspects which come from my very recent work. And I have, I'm contributing that chapter or that paper to uh, UNS Cup's uh, uh, one, one forthcoming volume. Uh, is that I'm also telling, in addition to the premature deindustrialization, most of these South Asian countries, I think including Bangladesh as well, they are facing premature declining share of trade in GDP, trade orientation. So the top figure is for Malaysia, and Malaysia is also facing falling uh, trade GDP ratio, but at a very high level of per capita income. And, uh, and you can see Malaysia already has a very high level of trade GDP ratio. But look at the other South Asian countries for this period. They had a falling trade GDP ratio in general. The common story is that they, their trade orientation is falling, and which actually is related to their trade policy and, uh, and a lack of effort to or success in diversifying export basket and many other related issues, uh, what I'll, 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 I'll tell at the very last, at the end in, when I try to summarize. What I also observe and this is something what I'm going to present here, that in terms of export composition, the South Asian countries are actually not doing really great compared to what Vietnam. So uh, you can see Bangladesh is have a very highly concentrated export basket. Uh, Pakistan is not too different because Pakistan has also a very high share of textile and garments. Uh, Sri Lanka's export basket is diversified, but again, not very high value-added exports. And India's case as well, uh, though India's export basket is diversified, but when it comes to, if you compare India's export basket with Vietnam's, the kind of uh, high value added products are there. India's export basket is still dominated by uh, very uh, you know, agricultural products, mineral products, and uh, not very high value added products. And let alone Nepal's export basket where we see very high dominance of the service sectors. So in terms of export basket as well, we are not seeing a kind of structural transformation, a uh, very high success of structural transformation in South Asian countries. Another point, another premature thing what is happening in South Asia, which is not really helping them for meaningful structural transformation, what we call the premature falling FDI GDP ratio or premature falling uh, 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 FDI orientation. Uh, except the very recent year in India, in general, the South Asian countries, these recent years, you can see, observe a falling uh, FDI GDP ratio. 
And we know that probably except India in recent years, South Asian countries are not very successful when it comes to attracting FDI. I have just put uh, 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 plotted Malaysia's and Vietnam's FDI GDP ratio, though they also experience some fluctuations, but in general, you can see Vietnam, their FDI, FDI GDP ratio is more than 4%, and, uh, 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 and Malaysia as well, except uh, in recent years, they maintain a very high level of FDI GDP ratio. So I think I'll, I'm at the very end of my, my last slide, is that when you talk about the, uh, the success of what are needed for successful structural, uh, structural transformation, here I'd like to highlight four major areas. First, I think I have already mentioned that there are some uh, policy-induced challenges, especially when it comes to trade policy, when it comes to FDI policy, and when it comes to policies led to export diversification. So this, most of the South Asian countries, they are facing a lot of challenges in terms of getting their policies right. Second one, a lot of supply side constraints in the form of weak infrastructure and high cost of doing business. This is common across almost all the South Asian countries. Probably Indian case is a bit, bit, bit better, but when you, when you take uh, India's by states, as well as, you know, some, in some cases, the aggregate figures hide some of the very, uh, you know, uh, differences at the very state level or at the ground level. So in general, these supply side constraints, uh, they don't really help diversification of the economy as well as diversification of the export basket. Most, all the South Asian countries, they suffer from lack of human capital. They invest still very low on education and health. If you look at their public expenditure on health and education, in general, South Asian countries, they don't spend high compared to their peers in Southeast Asian countries. And very finally, some of the institutional political challenges, I think I'm quite, I'm, I'm quite happy that my earlier presenter, he also highlighted some of the very important institutional challenges uh, when it comes to uh, in, uh, getting the right kind of incentives providing right kind of incentives for structural transformation or economic diversification. And some of the political economic challenges in terms of rent-seeking behaviors, in terms of cronism, uh, you know, and we, 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 we have seen that there are many uh, dominance of cronies in many of the South Asian countries, which inhibit getting the policies right, getting a right kind of industrial policy or broad-based industrial policy. I think all these deter uh, uh, you know, having a meaningful or successful structural transformation in South Asian countries. And we have to get our policies right. We have to get uh, our supply set constraints right and get them, uh, and especially get the right kind of infrastructure, get the right kind of human capital, and of course, solve many of the institutional challenges for uh, many of the South Asian countries they face. I'll stop here and thank you very much for giving me this work. Thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Salim Rehan. Uh, you have really dived deep into the issues of uh, a very specific type of uh, experience, growth experience that all the South Asian countries seem to be uh, caught up in and uh, some are doing better than others. But nevertheless, uh, when you uh, compare the South Asian experience with the Southeast Asian experience, there are uh, differences. And uh, a deeper question is that, um, will South Asia be able to break out of its development or under development uh, track, trap or uh, trajectory? Uh, or we do not have the enabling environment because I think uh, every year when we get together, we do talk of the same kind of political and institutional constraints that just don't seem to be tackled as even time is going by. I'm trying to relate it to my uh, presentation. They are almost like uh, gender and social norms. So maybe it's the time has come to talk about political norms. I mean, you know, why are political norms so uh, obstinate and so unchangeable in South Asia that, uh, you know, they're keeping South Asia back from its potential. 
So um, th with this, I uh, really thank you once again, and uh, I wish you were here to get your uh, memento, and we will keep it for you. So next time when you come to Pakistan, you can claim it from uh, Dr. Bushra. So, and hopefully um, you will not suffer a long power outage. That is, at least we have something in common. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ali. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Sakib Shirani, um, who is the CEO.